Okay, another light topic. We'll move on to miscellaneous E. This is an update on the district's instruction and operations during COVID-19. Seth and the administrative team. Yeah, so uh, uploaded this afternoon in your packet was a presentation that we'd like to walk through talking about uh, our COVID uh, response, um, the timeline of how we came to be in this virtual and our decision to move forward uh, post uh, November the uh, 2nd. So as you recall, on July 28th uh, of 2020, uh, we approved our reopening plan uh, in hybrid on September 1st. And we put up some data points there so you can get a picture of where our community was and where we were at as a district during that time in relationship to things such as active cases in the county, uh, total cases within the county, what that seven day new case rate was at 14.29 cases within our community, a, a burden rate over a 14 day rolling average and we'll explain that in, in a little bit further detail coming up. And the number of students and staff on the first day of school that were in quarantine at 44 and seven. And some of those were positive cases, some of those were close contacts, some of those were uh, in quarantine because they were symptomatic and awaiting tests. And at that time, all of our schools were in hybrid. On September 29th, looking at that Harvard Brown metric, the one that we, we shared with you before, where it really lists that if you have greater than 25 cases uh, on average in a seven day rolling average, that that would indicate that you have yeah, a lot of spread within your community. And you can see that we were at 100, uh, 191 active cases, uh, total cases, a seven day average around 25. And it was at this point when we started to see a huge increase of our students, 352. And that's not cumulative, that is actual on that day. So it was 352 kids on that day that were in quarantine and 60 staff members that were in quarantine and you can see within those 29 days of school how our, uh, the data points were across our community and within our school. 18 days later, when we made the decision to move to full virtual, you can see that the cases actively in our county went up by 475. We have total cases again went up by over 1300. That case rate jumped, or that seven day average jumped to 70 cases. And that we saw our students in, in quarantine jump, both students and staff, to 8, 12, 14, and, and uh, 117. And at that time, we had schools that were Jackson, ELC, et cetera, that were in virtual. And, and it was at that point that uh, we started having uh, difficulties, especially around the idea of contact tracing, securing our subs, having staff in our building. Uh, just to give you a visual representation of that data, the green indication is where we were at 9-1, the yellow or gold is at 9-29, and the red is at 10-16. And you can see the active cases, the average, the number of students, staff, and that burden rate. Also wanted to show you some increases and in what kind of a percent increase that we were seeing, a 500% increase of active cases. But you saw that student and staff percent increase decline of 1,750% um, within that time period between 9-1 to Next thing is looking at local case data uh, within our community. One of the things that's important to note is there's different areas within our community and our county that are expecting uh, experiencing different rates. Um, Jake, if you want to talk just a moment about the, these uh, charts that really come from the WEDS, which is the surveillance system that the state uses, that are broken down by zip code areas here, our two biggest zip codes for the students that we serve. Yeah, really what we tried to, to get at here and our nurses can pull this data for us off the state systems. 
just trying to get a feel for what it, it looks like locally in Sheboygan versus uh, other districts in the county. So we educate about 60% um, of the students in the county and we've seen 70, 75% of the cases um, when, when our nurses were able to pull the different zip codes. So, you know, we're seeing about 12, 13% more of the cases um, versus our population of students. Sheboygan Falls is about even with the, the number of cases they've seen to their population. Um, and then I think they're also able to pull uh, Kohler, Elkhart Lake, and Random Lake. And they, you know, they were educating about 2% five percent of the population and their cases were about half of their enrollment so uh, seeing more cases proportionally in Sheboygan than in our other school school districts the next slide just shows that same uh, representation of our students still in quarantine once again and then our staff once again One of the questions that had come up, one of the questions that had come up is, do we see spread within our schools? And uh, reading the chart or this this uh, illustration from left to right really shows that we have a few kids that started to display symptoms, and by the end, we had multiple positive kids and 90 people in. Uh, as considered close contacts in quarantine within about a, a week and a half process. So it starts on that Monday of week one where students are starting to see an increase, but we're not seeing any direct links. It's just more kids displaying four to six having COVID-like symptoms, no pattern. By that Friday, we've got a person who felt ill, was in school that day, developed symptoms. By Monday, we started to see an uptick at that school of cases. No obvious room involvement, meaning we're not able to link it to a specific room, but we're seeing a specific increase at that building. That person that became ill on Friday finally was able to get tested on Tuesday because of the lack of quick access to testing within our community. On Wednesday and Thursday, we start seeing an uptick in staff at that building, including kitchen maintenance, and other roles within that building. And the absenteeism rates uh, average uh, higher, and we have 10 new reports of students in, in uh, illness or on quarantine due to, due to uh, the situation. That Thursday, second person in the same room developed symptoms and is sent home. By Friday, the first person's test results come back. So they tested on Tuesday, got the results on Friday. A second person, uh, now has it had had symptoms was a close contact and now is designated as a probable um, and we start looking at close contacts within that room however the second person can't get tested again we were seeing that community uh, testing issue and then by Saturday of that we're seeing a third person in that room uh, was tested in quarantine uh, having symptoms other people are having symptoms and they're called probable cases as well. And then you see that's when on a weekend we had to make a decision to move the school completely to virtual as by contact tracing those individuals, we ended up with 90 people and of those 90, at least 12 were already symptomatic. So you can clearly see that, that spread that's occurring amongst, uh, in this case, this illustration from a, an example in a, in a school here in Sheboygan. Obviously we're protecting the, the school name and, and staff and students um, in this scenario, but that, this is one that our nurses, uh, uh, Lori and Terry, put together for us as we were talking about that school spread and the timeline associated with that spread. iPad is doing weird things right now. Technology. 
technology works great when it works. <laughs> it's back. It's back. All right, it'll, it'll disappear on your screen in just a second. It's gone. Sorry about that. So um, during that time then, when we made the transition then to, to virtual, we took some, some actions to ensure that we've got strong SNI uh, roles and leadership to continue on our education, some HR steps and some business steps. So I'm going to turn over to Jake, Andrea, and Mark just to talk through what we're currently doing now as we've transitioned into that virtual environment. Yeah, and I'll be quick here. I think you heard it from the two students that presented at the beginning of the night that obviously virtual poses challenges. It's not ideal, it's not what, what we want, um, but it's, it's where we find ourselves. So the real uh, <coughs> that, that we wanted to do this year was to make sure that students had a organized structure to their day. So elementary students are logging on three times a day. Uh, those teachers communicated with, with their students and their families at, at what time uh, they needed to be on to do that those live lessons and then the rest of the day uh, They're provided with virtual learning software be it something like IXL, Pathways, or Myon, etc. And in middle school um, High school following their exact same belt schedule. So kids are just logging on to their class to start um, teachers are on there with them and they're either teaching a what we would call kind of a synchronized lesson where they're just live, you know, just teaching a live lesson and, and, and video recording themselves um, for the, the students to follow along, or it might be some asynchronous work and then the teachers are hanging out on the Google Meet in case kids have questions um, so that they can get immediate help on, on their work. So really just keeping that organization for students, attendance gets taken daily, parents can be notified if kids aren't logging on, um, all that good stuff. So. Like, again, like we heard those kids say, we're just trying to help them with the organizational piece of it. So from a human resources standpoint, we'll continue to track our staff um, absences and COVID-related exposure. And our staff has been great about continuing to fill out our staff tracking forms. And then um, in regards to pay um, for our employees during this time period, the majority of our employees will continue to to get paid. We have redeployed some of our staff to other assignments um, during this time to try to make sure everyone's as active as possible and engaged with our students. Um, I would say that it's significantly different from in the spring as far as how we're using our support staff and getting them involved with our students. So that's excellent. Um, the only staff that um, would not um, be paid during this time are those um, rec department employees that, you know, teach swim lessons, and that's not happening right now, um, those types of individuals, but otherwise, we're trying to maintain everyone's salary and getting them engaged uh, with students. From the business services side, um, so we're continuing to uh, have our custodial and contracted cleaning uh, work through this. They're continuing to clean the buildings. Um, our custodial staff is helping with some uh, light maintenance duties that we, we're getting done at those buildings during this time. Uh, meal pickup uh, continues at 12 locations and uh, that will continue throughout this. And, um, and then the proposed amendment for the bus contract that you just passed, uh, again, to help retain uh, the drivers so they're ready to go when we're, when we're back in the building. So that's where we've been uh, from the start of the school year till now in these uh, two weeks of virtual. The decision to move forward into what's our next step really relies then on where does, where's our community and where are we sitting now uh, within our school system uh, in terms of cases, activity. Uh, so uh, from yesterday's report at the county level, you see those confirmed cases go up, active, going up, um, the hospitalizations, and et cetera. And you can see that case over time. We're gonna break this data down a little bit further to kind of put in perspective of where we've been and where are we at now. So current status, really just uh, working through this, current status now is 1,400 active cases, 
uh, 43, uh, a little over 4,300 total cases. The seven day case average, we're averaging over 90 new cases a day within our county. And that, that is, um, include, that excludes any of the, the, um, the inmate population um, at KMCI because those uh, individuals are not out in our community and are contained within that space. And so I just wanted to mention that if I failed to do so previously. Uh, positive students, that's the number of students that are actually uh, have been uh, positive uh, COVID uh, between the start of the school year and now. Uh, likewise for staff and obviously our schools are right now all in virtual. So putting that data from where we started the year to where we're at today, at 100 active cases to 1,400 active cases, looking at that seven day average, again from 14 to 113. When we look at that seven day average, that's really using that Harvard path to zero, and that 25 or higher, and we're at over 100, that 25 or higher is what Harvard would say is at a tipping point. And they're saying that of 25 cases per 100,000 people, that that's at that tipping point, and that their recommendation from their research would be that that's where you have stay at home or other limiting orders being put in place. And you can see that yellow, um, orange level and green level. Likewise, we end up at a, at a burden rate and really looking at a 14 day average for a burden rate per 10,000 people. One of the metrics that we looked at and we continue to, to rely upon <coughs> is the Minnesota school reopening guidance. This is the state of Minnesota's plan in which they have come up with a state plan that really specifies using local data, what does it mean for schools and how they should be operating. As you recall, Wisconsin said they deferred that to each local school district. But when you look at, at Minnesota's plan, and a lot of people are, are using this as a model, when you look at Minnesota's plan, they're suggesting, and you can kind of see down the left-hand side there, that that case rate on a 14-day average, back when we started school, we were less than, we were around that 16 or to 20, where it really says elementary in person, middle school hybrid, and high school hybrid. And that's how we open the year, elementary kids in school, and the middle school, high school. On the 29th, it talks about everybody in a hybrid, and remember, we started our elementaries already in hybrid because we wanted to make sure we had those low class sizes to mitigate contact tracing the best that we could. And then at 1016, we were above that um, number. And you can see between 107 and 1020, that number went to 146. We're almost three times that number where in the Minnesota guidance talking about everybody should be at a distance or virtual learning environment. Another metric that is used and often reported is positivity rate. So of the tests being administered in a community, what percentage of tests are coming back? Uh, as of yesterday, the Sheboygan County positivity rate was 39.5%. So out of all the tests given on a certain day, 40, almost 40%, are, are coming back as a positive COVID case. The state average is 24%. And that mirrors what we're seeing in some of our staff data in terms of the number of staff uh, who are getting testing, what percent of our staff are coming back positive. Looking into and leaning into the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, they have a policy lab and they put out guidance this summer and they again updated this guidance uh, and there were some links into a New York Times article uh, this weekend, but really looking at their guidance where they talked about do we have, where's the incident rate in our community? So looking at that rate and burden, but also where's that positivity rate? On the very bottom, when positivity rate gets above 9%, they're saying that there's widespread community transmission of COVID and that they recommendation would be to have schools in virtual format. 
one of the things that they noted in the article was that when you get above that 9% or greater, that you end up in incidences where that inability for your county health department and others to contact trace. From our data, we can surely see that when we started to climb in that positivity, that the ability for us to contact trace and public health to contact trace surely became a challenge. And then finally, looking at our staff positivity cases. Uh, again, this is the number of staff. You can see on this timeline where we started the year, where 929 has occurred, and that climb that we're seeing, and more and more cases continue each day. Uh, the updated numbers uh, push that student case up another uh, about eight or so today, and staff uh, went up as well today. So we're continuing to see that, that, that trend as we move forward, uh, unfortunately, in positive cases. The health department in Sheboygan has been an interesting uh, challenge, and uh, I, I mean no uh, disrespect to the health department. They're doing the best that they can under the circumstance, but I can sure you tell you that they are completely overwhelmed in trying to contact trace, and because of the number of cases and the positivity rate. They were just in, uh, several weeks ago, and when school started and things happened after about the second or third week of school, they really pushed the contact tracing back to the schools, but they were still supporting that. As of late, it's been, we contact trace everything, we take all the information that we glean from the contact trace, we fill out their shared document forms to put all the numbers, email addresses, parent contacts, et cetera, into their form. They may have the ability to follow up with those people one phone call, if they don't reach them, they're just sending emails to those individuals. On Monday, uh, we were told that they are no longer contact tracing to follow up with positive cases um, of the close contacts. They're relying on the individual who tested positive to distribute the literature to their close contacts in order to uh, tell them what they need to do and how long they need to quarantine for. Clearly, the system is overwhelmed. Uh, you may have heard through the discussion and the communication come out Friday, but if you recall, we shared a metric, and I've got it embedded in the slide coming up, that the health department proposed to schools that would lead in decision making about when we should be in the virtual or hybrid or face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, last Friday and last week, they came out saying that they are no longer going to follow that guidance, and that they're going to be creating some new guidance yet to, to be announced. And at this point, they're not making any recommendations about what schools should or shouldn't be doing. I don't know if any recommendations will be forthcoming. Uh, however, we do continue to have ongoing conversations. Uh, three times plus a week, we've got staff in meetings with them uh, going across. And I've had personal conversations uh, continue uh, weekly or more with both Star Grossman the public health officer, and Adam Payne at the county. Um, and part of my discussion today with Adam was to share my frustration in terms of some lack of, of clarity from the health department on how they can help us set the guidance from a health standpoint so that we then can make recommendations on an education standpoint, which is really our role. I feel like we've become the health department to deal with COVID within our schools. And, and I, again, that's been a little frustration and overtaxing for our staff. And our staff has done, done a tremendous job, I must say. Uh, but it uh, surely isn't uh, our area of expertise, but we've learned a lot. Uh, this was the previous metric that they had, the epidemiology, healthcare, and public health. Last week, um, those indicators um, surely changed. And uh, one of the things that occurred is the healthcare. You, and uh, we're going to talk about that healthcare. Um, the emergency notifications put out, but these metrics uh, were supposed to be updated Friday with all being read. And when they were all read, it would lead to the severe risk category. In this case, where they would have recommended previously no face-to-face -face school or, or activities and virtual co-curriculars only. Again, they did not um, 
come up with that recommendation, they've decided to pause using these metrics. Um, so we, I, at this point, do not have a recommendation from County Health. Uh, this is the, the information I was sharing about the alarming trend. This was put out last week, talking about the hospital capacities from St. Nick's and Aurora and where they're at in terms of patients. The link there allows you to read their emergency action alert, which is really, again, guidance to say to the public, uh, we need to be taking this seriously due to the fact that we're, our hospitals are reaching capacity. And that would have, these metrics here that are listed in this document then would have turned that to red. Uh, thus we come today to talk about the fact of what does the future bring for the Sheboygan Area School District staff, students, parents, and our community. Based on our numbers and the continued upward trajectory of those numbers, uh, we're recommending that we continue to add two additional weeks or another incubation cycle of COVID, uh, meaning that we would go virtual between now and hope to come back on November the 16th. Uh, we would, in that case, communicate on October 28th. That would be tomorrow. We'd be communicating with families about this decision to extend this two weeks and continue to look at the data. And we'd continue to confer with uh, Sheboygan County Health. Uh, we'd review metrics and uh, create a proposal to and come back to you as again as a board on the November 10th board meeting and share where we're at at that time and what the next recommendation and 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 uh, would be, and then communicate out next steps to our parents on the 11th. The rationale, again, to extend this virtual learning really relies on the fact that that Harvard Brown metric, and in the absence of a, a local health department or state agency, uh, which has then made us as school districts uh, have to make these decisions, we uh, had shared with you previously that notion of looking at that daily rate. And you can see that the, the metric from Minnesota and we've talked about that previously, the Children's Hospital is upward, the number of students and staff. We've seen spread in our schools, and obviously we've consulted with County Health. Uh, County Health says they're 100% supportive, they understand, and they are very concerned about the spread in our county, and they're supportive of us, they're just not making any recommendations at this time. It, it, I think it's key to understand that there's not one single metric that universally can fit each area um, in each unique school district. And so some people might be asking, well, I see that Sheboygan Area School District is making this decision. Why aren't other districts? And we, we can surely look at the, the numbers within our community and numbers within what we're dealing with in our local district um, is, is different. Um, but I can surely tell you that uh, in conferring with our county superintendents this week, that they are at the closure of classroom uh, level in multiple school districts across where we were at several weeks ago. And we have been following, unfortunately, in the wrong trend of where our Fox Valley and, and uh, Brown County, Manitowoc counties have been. Uh, we were in a different spot than they have been when they started the year, and unfortunately Sheboygan now has, has the, been there. So we will continue to, to look at these metrics of the, of the Brown, the burden rate, the positivity rate. We'll continue to monitor that staffing and student quarantine data. And obviously if there's new recommendations coming from the health department, we would factor that in. Um, and to see where the county health department um, is that if they're going to be coming out with any new recommendations or, or guidance. <coughs> and at, at this point, I'll open it up to the EMT members to add to uh, anything that I may have missed or for the board to, to address questions. Marcia, did you have your hand up? 
Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I think you're on mute. sensitive to the families who are in crisis um, because they, they for many uh, varied and valid reasons they need their children need it they need it um, what what can we do uh, to help those families out are there are there any ideas any thoughts I I, I, I don't know what can be done I I'm, I'm, I'm angry that, that our public health function has, has painted us into this corner, uh, but I still, uh, I mean, we, we need to lean into it, so I'm wondering if there's anything that can be done for those families that really need to engage our students in, in other ways than just virtual. Yes, uh, we agree, Marcos, so largely that uh, the, the challenges that this faces uh, in a public health emergency crisis that this, uh, unfortunately, being in a virtual model impacts our families. So uh, a couple of things that we are, are, are take very seriously that is one is the mental health of our kids. So we continue to provide uh, a, a, a white virtual uh, access to guidance and counseling, our past program mental health services. And we also have our social workers at school sites and, and school counselors actively engaging those families that are, in, that are in need and how to connect them with community resources that are out there. The other thing that we're doing is we're, we're talking with our community partners, the YMCA, Boys and Girls Club, um, for some examples, the uh, Above and Beyond Children's Museum, the difficulty that they're facing is that some of the same challenges that we're facing is they're trying to open and provide some additional services for those families, but they have limited capacity. And uh, quite frankly, some of those groups have also said the two week hiatus to virtual learning that we had to take to start with helped them because they were struggling with fulfilling their own staffing needs as well. And so they stopped programming in many of those organizations for the same period, um, but they're trying hard as well to try to look at what other community is out there. And we know that access is often talked about. What does internet access look like and bandwidth access for families? And it's not just uh, uh, the internet access, it may be two or three kids sharing internet access within a household. And what does that look like? 
And so that definitely is a concern. And uh, Mike Jaber and his team under Jake have really put in uh, access points, have been able to turn around uh, hot spots for families uh, within a day. Um, and also I've looked at trying different styles of hotspots depending on where they're at. At the end of the day, they're still cell phone enabled. So there's some areas in our community uh, within a building that aren't as good, uh, but I've tried to troubleshoot those as, as well. I think the question becomes, if we have continued spread and if there's continued um, uh, issues with our community, we have kids that need additional services and what does that look like um, if we have to go longer than these than these next two weeks? And we, that will be part of our planning to come back to or what are some additional things we might be able to do as a district. But again, we've got to talk about safety for our students, safety for each other, and safety for our, for our staff. Um, does that, Marcos, address some of your question? It does. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, I also want to express concern, and, and I know I'm taking time away from Larry, and I don't ever want to be in front of Larry. Um, yeah, I, I want to express concern over our our staff. Uh, are, are they being taken care of? Um, I know Andrea mentioned that most of them are getting paid during this, this virtual time off. Are, are they still perceiving uh, benefits even during isolation or quarantine, depending on where they're at, and and, and are they receiving uh, some some maybe wraparound support? Well, because it has to be tough on them as well. Are Are you speaking of individuals who have tested positive or are quarantined, Marcos? Uh, yeah, both. Uh, I mean, I'm sure the anxiety levels of the people who aren't. Uh, uh, isolating or quarantined are really high, but I'm sure the people who are isolating and, and quarantined because they've tested positive or are symptomatic are even higher. Are they getting the support they need? Yeah. So um, Anna Schmidt, our, uh, our wellness coordinator, is in regular contact with those individuals that are completing our um, staff tracking form, as well as myself. Uh, um, and so I, you know, I just have, we've just really got positive feedback regarding her interactions with staff. And um, she's uh, RN, so she can answer a lot more questions than I can about COVID, but um, she's just very compassionate, um, has been there for people, follows up with people after the fact to, to see how they're doing. So there is certainly that support. Um, we've done a lot around the, um, about referring people to EAP um, during this very stressful time, we have um, a self-care initiative going on this quarter for all of our employees where we're uh, providing resources for staff um, to help them, um, you know, help, help them during this stressful time. So certainly we are, uh, we are providing all those resources for our employees, but we're always open to suggestions because I'm sure there's other things that we haven't thought of, but we, you know, I, I do think and I get the sense from our staff that I've talked to that they do feel supported in that way. Yeah, Larry, go ahead. I just, I just sitting here in awe because um, just listening to the ideas that are coming out and the things that are going on are just extremely impressive. Um, just starting with Andrea's point, uh, just building a little bit on the wonderful things you're offering our employees, is there any way that we can offer wellness points, uh, you know, to help toward discount insurance for employees that take advantage of this, in addition to other opportunities we allow people to earn, you know, points uh, to offset costs of health care, just, just as another way to encourage people, you know, take advantage of those these resources you're you're mentioning um, I'm just putting that out there I don't need an answer now and and um, earlier in the evening we heard a student talk about Reagan uh, one of our guidance counselors what he's doing Seth talked about the thing that's going on at Sheridan and I, I'm just wondering a uh, community member Steve Hamer had suggested to me if there's any way that we can get our 
students at each of our buildings talking with each other and sharing with each other how they're doing with COVID and what they're doing to keep busy. It's, and just kind of being a conduit for our students to stay in touch with each other. Uh, sadly that they can't do it in person, but come up with ways that we can facilitate that um, virtually. So I'm just throwing that out there as uh, for brainstorming and, and obviously it's not something we can implement necessarily over the next two weeks, but should this thing drag on and you talk of, you know, about future planning, maybe that's something we consider. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Other questions or come? Yeah, okay, go ahead. So, I mean, there's a million numbers that came out and I don't have them all in front of me now, but I mean, it was it was abundantly obvious that, that the recommendation to extend it another two weeks is the only only option we really have. It makes sense completely to me. Um, I did have a question looking at the, we had a month ago, we had 800 and some students and then that similar number now was about 100 and some. Is that because of the impact of being out of school or is that because they're not reported? How do we get the number of students that are in quarantine? How do we get that number when they're not in school? Sure, so a couple ways, Kay. And, and the 107 that's listed on this slide at the end is also the number of positive uh, cases, not the number of kids in quarantine. Um, and okay. 73 okay. was the staff. Um, you're right, one of the challenges with uh, when we're in a virtual mode is maintaining the tracking of kids that are in, that are in or on quarantine. If they've tested positive or a staff member in their household tested positive, our nurses are tracking that information through that WED system, that state database, and they're able to know how many kids are in quarantine uh, in okay. those regards. It's the kids who are sick or developing symptoms that we would have excluded from school who maybe mom or dad isn't taking them to a doctor or they're not able to get testing, we lose sight of those kids. Um, okay. And so that becomes a harder metric but uh, on the student side, but we clearly saw that line of increase uh, go on, but we also saw that same line increase on our staff side, and that is mirrored our students in terms of an increase. And Andrea and Anna, uh, that uh, our wellness coordinator continue to monitor all of our staff because they're working. They need to be reporting their information uh, and we would not allow them to, you know, if they're in quarantine and so forth, that we would continue to monitor those, those individuals. Was, thank you. Was I correct in, in hearing that you said that approximately that 39% positivity rate was effectively the rate we were seeing in our staff positivity? We were seeing an average of about 24% positivity rate in our staff, which is actually okay. what the state of Wisconsin average was yesterday. Okay. Now, this, this thing with the metric, um, first of all, I, I, Marcos, I couldn't be more in line with what you're saying. I, I don't understand how they can just say, we're not going to do this part of our job. You're, you're a very nice man, Seth, but I, I, would, I don't know how you keep your composure. I, I, I seriously, I mean, it, it's really not optional that they're not giving out any kind of information for what the risk factors are for the schools and what the schools should be doing when they are the point of reference. I mean, we, we delayed what we were gonna decide over, this, over the summer and what we were gonna announce to our parents, waiting and waiting and waiting to hear from them and then we just finally had to kind of move ahead on our own and now we're into this and again they're not being helpful i'm sorry that's beyond frustrating to me yes. um, and that's key at I both levels the state this, level this and uh, in the county level that's at both levels the state and county the great perfect uh the the metric that they're talking about putting out that's going to be changing are they giving you any insight into that it's going to be more lenient or more strict the reason I bring that up, and I, I really hesitate to even mention it because we don't need anything else piled on to this unfortunate situation, but the most recent information from the CDC where they're saying 
and exposure is no longer 15 minutes of sustained uh, interaction, but it's 15 minutes cumulative over a 24 hour period, that seems to me to make it even more difficult to have FaceTime school. That can be, that, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt again. If, if you're asking about that new C, the new CDC guidance, actually the, yeah. the one thing the state of Wisconsin did get right is they, they recommended that we use that from day one. So we have actually been using that guidance from the, the state that was their recommendation and guidance to contact Trace okay. based on the 15 minutes cumulative time. Okay. And okay, we good. have been doing that. Okay. So do you know what the metric change they're proposing is? What direction they're going? I haven't, I haven't the foggiest idea. Uh, I do have a meeting with them uh, tomorrow morning at 7.30. And I know okay. that they have said they might want to, what they're going to do last Friday, they said they were going to try to have an updated metric for this Friday. But I have not seen it. And as of this afternoon, it did not sound like they had one. Okay. If you get something like that, will you share it with us, or do we have to wait till the next month's meeting? To no, we can we can share that. Okay. Do you know? Do you know? I mean, I understand that that the smaller districts have a substantially lower rate than we have. Is that because of population density, or when people ask, you know, why is our rate so much higher? What what would you recommend we say? Yeah, and that's not, to be clear, that's that's the rate of just positive cases. So that's not within schools, that's just within those zip codes, adults, kids, everything. Um, okay. we, we've asked that question to County Health. Uh, <laughs> I don't think any, I don't think anyone knows for certain. Um, lots of people take stabs at that, but there isn't anything publicly that, that I'd be willing to say or that, that anyone has put forth that makes a lot of sense other than population density is always mentioned. Yeah, okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Uh, this is Mark. Could I, could you just paint a picture for me as far as our staff, and uh, now that we've gone to all virtual, do we still have staff coming to the schools in order to teach from the school in the virtual environment? and uh, whether or not any of our teachers that were maybe on quarantine but that weren't ill, were they able to uh, teach remotely while they were in isolation? Yeah, so we had, we did that whenever we could. If a teacher was, was well enough and had the capabilities to teach virtually, we could put a, an EA in their, their classroom if we had an EA that was available um, and they could teach remotely and, and now since we've gone 100% virtual, staff can come in and, and teach from their classrooms uh, if, if they see that's, that's best for what they need to do. And, and like I said earlier, so it's those, you know, at the elementary, it's those three sessions a day. And then at the high school, their middle school, they're just following their bell schedule. Um, so they're essentially online all day long with their kids. I, I guess I just wasn't sure how that was physically working with our teachers if they're teaching from home or teaching from school. Yeah, they can do either or. All right. I would, uh, in, in taking that into consideration, I, I would, uh, we're, some of the communications we're getting in regards to parents wanting face-to-face uh, -face or in-school instruction I would hope that considerations are being made as far as our ability to staff specific schools um, and, and or grade levels as part of our going back to a hybrid model or, or full face-to-face -face, as opposed to just a, a painting with such a broad brush that the community is at a high rate, so we need to shut down all schools. I would hope that we would take into consideration our ability to provide education to the students in a, in a safe and face-to-face -face manner. And I guess that's what I would be looking to in, in the uh, two weeks from now. Any other comments, questions?
Okay. Thank you, Seth and the team. And I really have to thank the team for an outstanding job yeah. of continuing this, this work. This teachers, time. staff, everyone, parents who are delivering for their kids, kids who are hanging in there. Um, it's um, Hopefully we can all come together and get through this sooner than later. This is not anybody's ideal. It is not fun, that's for sure. We need to get back to normal as soon as we can. David? Yeah? Quick question. Seth, is that information um, that you just presented to us, will that be available on our website for parents to yeah. understand these metrics? Yes, it will be actually in the parent communication will go out tomorrow morning. It'll actually be linked to the presentation off of our website. Excellent. Thank you so much. I also would like to thank you. It was an excellent presentation and it really helps us understand just how severe the situation is and it is not improving. Yeah. And, it, and it's sad because our children and our staff, you know, in our community if we would be able to contain, you know, even another two weeks. And, um, you know, we hear about all the professional athletes being in a bubble. And with Mark's comment about some schools, if everybody would be in their own bubble and there would be no contamination, that's one thing. But when we have this population density issue, um, it's really hard to contain. So, but thank you for all your hard work. You're welcome.